more undermines the objectivity of moral values than our gradual, fallible apprehension of the physical world undermines the reality of the physical world. If moral values are gradually discovered rather than invented, then their objectivity is ensured. Next question is from the Internet. Thank you. And this one is for Dr. Mahatney from Becky Levitt at Penn State University. You said that you can't understand unjustified pain, but that we can come to terms with it. I would like to know what you think the source of the evildoer is. What drives man to perform evil? Oh, um, in my statement, and uh, I did not focus upon moral evil, actually. Um, I was focusing only upon pain and suffering. That means it is not the it is not the agent who inflicts evil on others, but it is the recipient who is inflicted upon the pain which concerns me. That means the agent's temptation to make evil or the propensity, uh, I, I would be willing to go in for the best explanation that is available. But I could not fit in, which is much more serious, namely the victims. Um, the subjection to pain, uh, unmerited pain and suffering which seem to me to not to fit in into any of our neat, neat uh, world views. So I don't have ready-made a theory of what leads people to moral wickedness. There would be uh, what Aristotle called weakness of the will. There may be many other factors which contribute to it, actually. Temptation. It's very important to point out here. It's a very good question. Even in Hinduism and Buddhism, it became an inescapable struggle. Gautama Buddha, who dealt with uh, dukkha, the problem of pain and suffering so much, even, even he could not escape human instigation in this. And in one of his sermons, brought in the fact that suffering and evil had human, in, uh, human agency to it. And the whole law of karma, which uh, comes as the wheel of reincarnation and the inheriting of either part or, or, or some of the totality of your previous incarnation, uh, the karmic, uh, the karmic uh, law protagonists, first of all, never try to explain how it entered, a question that Dr. Craig asked earlier. But then you're paying, you're paying, you're paying in every reincarnation. And so human agency comes in there too. And so while the victim may be an important facet here, all of the major, major religious worldviews do not know how to struggle with this instigator factor. And it's fascinating, even you hear Dr. Bernard Lykin here a moment ago, all the bad things that he talked about were given to God. All the wonderful cures we brought about. You see, uh, it, this is uh, some kind of uh, um, duplicity going on in here. You know, you, well, you just can't uh, uh, ac accept as if any goodness has come from him. Let's, uh, let's, let's take an example of the struggle in Yugoslavia, which is taking place between uh, uh, a Catholic people who believe Jesus, and I assume nearly everything you uh, believe, yes, and sir. an Eastern Orthodox people uh, also believe in uh, uh, the godliness of Jesus and something similar to your views, uh, and a Muslim people who uh, uh, have the idea that Jesus was a great teacher, uh, and, and probably if we went and asked them, they'd all agree there were some absolute moral values. Uh, and yet, no one can figure out what they are, and they're slaughtering one another. So, uh, even, even if you think there are absolute moral values, you're still confronted with the problem of how, in this life, you have to decide yourself whether to behave a, how, what you are going to do every day. Uh, and uh, most, most people who are doing evil things, like these people in Yugoslavia, don't believe that they're bad and evil people. Uh, they, they think, that, uh, I mean, the Serbs think that they're moral in defending their society uh, and the whole world's wrong and against them. Uh, and they're, uh, so every one of those people uh, believe, e even though they, I believe they're creating evil, every one of them believes that they're behaving in a, a moral, good way. I think there's a very important, uh, you've raised an important point, And I think it's a point that uh, is a dark blotch upon history. Yeah. The religious wars, the, the deadly scourge that people in the name of God have perpetrated. But Dr. Lykin, I think there's an important point of difference to note. Um, the logical outworking of atheism allows for what you've just said. Let me finish my point here now. A man like Stalin, a man like Mao, 
Stalin made a definite change in his religious commitment while he was at seminary and decided he no longer could believe in God and ruled over a people obliterating 15 million of his own people. Logical outworking of his belief that man was whatever you defined him to be. There was no objective moral value. When you take somebody who in the name of religion and, and the name of God would do this, that's not in keeping and consistency with the name of the person the teaching of Christ. That's radically inconsistent. Saddam Hussein today, as one of my colleagues was pointing out and over the BBC, Saddam Hussein today may call his country a democracy, but we would hardly uphold Iraq and what is being done there as, as that which epitomizes democracy. Changing labels on an empty bottle doesn't make any difference. Well, what's inside needs to be labeled. So when you take the example of religious people, it is important to point out that they may be doing these horrible, so terrible things outside and inconsistent with what they claim to believe. But in atheism, there is a possibility to logically connect it. And that's the well, fearsome thing. Uh, yes, so Let's go over uh, to a call. We've got a question okay. over here, if we can. Dr. Lykin. <clears throat> Your question for Dr. Lykin. Go ahead. Where's the question coming from? We had from? a question for Dr. Lykin here. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, if, uh, so, so, this is for Dr. Lykin. If society is moral lawgiver, then can you define exactly what society is? Because I come from a country where they pray cows, and my son will be calling them stakes down the road. So, here, that's my country. They will be praying to cows, but my friends will be calling it stakes down here. If society is answer to everything, yes, can you so, define what it is? Right. Well, there are, there are many different countries, and, and, uh, and I, I would want to call it a society. So in some, in some regard, your society overlaps with ours. We have common human aspects, but we've also lived apart, and all of us are trying experiments to find what is the moral system that uh, will help us fulfill ourselves and, uh, and for our society to be most successful. So your society is uh, trying out uh, whether it can succeed without eating uh, beef. And uh, here in America, we're doing our best to eat as many of them as we can. Uh, and, uh, no one, and, and there are many more cows around because we're eating them. And uh, so no one knows what history will show as to which way is the best way. On the other side, and then change it again when I come back here. Uh, well, if you, if you travel from one society to another, you always have the difficulty of fitting into the new society. And you have to decide whether you're going to change to adapt to the new one or whether you are going to try to maintain your own values. This is the famous problem of uh, immigrant societies. Question from the Internet. <clears throat> yes, this is for uh, Dr. Zacharias. This is from Lowell Haig at, the, at South Dakota State University. It says that six and a half years ago, uh, I lost my sister to a very aggressive form of breast cancer. I watched her fight and go through one and a half years of hell. Was there a divine purpose to this suffering that my sister endured prior to her death? After all, she was a devout Christian. Was her suffering deserved? Why did God allow her to endure so much pain? These are questions I have been struggling with since she died. Did he say the question, his name was Lowell? What's yes. the first name of the questioner? Lowell Haig. Yeah, Lowell, I appreciate you raising this. I think this is at the heart of what it is all about. And all of the platitudes and the theories that we can give to you may seem country miles away from where you're really struggling and coping with this. So let me tell you this. From the point of view of a naturalist, there is no explanation. You need no explanation. She just happens to be here part of the furniture of the universe. She's dead. She's gone. You're never going to see her again. You have to find some way to come to terms with it, and there is no explanation, no answer for it. But in the, in the purposes of God within the Christian framework that I give to you, the God who has fashioned this world, who loves you, values you, gives you intrinsic value, reminds you that this three score world years and ten is not the only years that you have that within this framework of this time, you and I, many of us can go through suffering. I've buried both my father and my mother. I have been with, uh, with people where I've seen uh, an awful lot of tragedy come, but two or three things happen. Number one, because I know the script, I know that is not the last line in your sister's life. Number two, 
Jesus Christ